The sea is one of the most hostile environments known to man, but for centuries he has braved the dangers for the rewards that lie below the surface. Today, the fishing boats that challenge the sea are highly specialized, staying at sea for weeks on end. Unworried by distance and unaffected by the weather, the modern fisherman uses the most advanced equipment to search out the shoals. The anchor meter is revolutionized fishing. Well, it's like if you're playing blind man's buff, let's lift up the handkerchief, isn't it? You can see what you're doing. Using echo meters, fish are guaranteed. There's no time wasted trawling empty seas. Once on board, the fish are quickly processed, frozen, and packed away. But large ships catching vast quantities of fish may not be making the best use of their equipment. To help them, scientists are carrying out many different experiments, particularly to find out the best way to use the net. First of all, let's take a look at the net. 75% of the fish caught in Britain today are taken with some form of trawl. Most of that quantity being taken with the so-called small Granton trawl standing behind me now. Trawls are movable drag nets moved forward over the seabed at a nice convenient walking pace of three or four miles an hour and of course they have to be kept open. Here are one of the two otter boards which serve a double function holding the net open and also by the disturbance they make crashing over the seabed tending to frighten fish into the path of the net. Attached about one third of the way forward so that the otterboard is constantly acting as a kite and pulling outwards as it's dragged along by the trawler, we have the warp here running back to that goalpost representing the ship. In fact, of course, uh, the ship is very much further away than that, could be anything up to a third of a mile away and 600 feet uh, above this otterboard. Moving back towards the net, one next has a long wire cable connected to this wooden device, the Dan Lino, which came to us from France in 1922. They called it the Gangido. Our fishermen couldn't get their tongues around that one, so they rechristened it Dan Lino after a comedian of the time. Then two short legs connected to the Dan Lino take us to the net itself. Here we have the headline, the upper lip of the net, which is lifted by these floats to a height of seven to eight feet in the center. Of running along the seabed in this trawl rig for flatfish catching, 
uh, we have three ticks of chains. Disturbing flatfish on the bottom, which are then lifted up over this heavily weighted ground rope, wrapped in rubber disc, which keeps it down tight onto the seabed. And the fish pass down here through this narrowing tunnel towards the cod end. I can't get all the way, but they finish up in the extreme end of the net, somewhere down here. To help make sure that fish do find their way into the trawl, an experiment is being tried with several hundred fish. A small transmitter is attached to each fish, in this case, a place. That's a good knot. Right, here's the cutter. Okay, you step. Right, there we are. The lip. Gone away. The place is tracked by one of the laboratory's research ships. A signal from the ship activates the transmitter on the fish so that its exact position is revealed. The place now appears as the bright dot at the top of the two displays. The picture on the left is an enlargement of the one on the right. Next, a trawler is guided to the fish and shoots its net. The outline of its trawl will appear as an echo picture on the screen. Now, the trawler attempts to catch the fish so that it can be seen how it escapes, if it does. This particular attack was successful. The place was guided by the towing warps into the path of the net which overtook it and swallowed it up. In order to catch a fish, it's essential to find out as much about its behavior as we can. Here at the Tari Research Station in Aberdeen, a light shone down from a traveling gantry lures cod round a tank to observe how long and how fast they swim. It's been found that cod can cruise at about four miles per hour for weeks at a time, but faster than that for only short bursts. So the trawl is designed to herd the cod at cruising speed in front of it. Then, when the ship speeds up, the fish quickly tire and fall back into the net. Now the otter boards which hold the net open and the bobbins and chains which hold it down on the seabed are banging and rattling, thumping along the ground and really kicking up quite a frightening noise. This trawl is moving in shallow water, but in the typical deep water fishery that most trawls operate, there would be little light. So the main reaction of the fish must be to noise. Studies are now being made to find out which noises frighten the fish away and which noises herd them into the path of the net. Like the rest of the research, this knowledge should lead to a modification of the gear and an increase in the catch. But as the methods of catching fish improve, there's a danger that too many fish will be caught and the stocks may disappear. Already, some fish are very scarce and prices are rising. Hey, Garbage, 20 volts, 20 volts, 20 volts, 20 volts, 20 volts, 40 volts, 20 volts, 40, 60, and 20 volts, 60, and 20 volts, 80, and 20 volts, band, and 20 volts, band of air, and 20 volts, band of air, 20 volts, 20, no, sir, 40, and 20 volts, 40, 20 volts, 40, band, and 20 volts, 40, Sally, sir. Down to Mr. Hayward. Now then, 50 kilos, small place. 50 kilos, small place. 20 volts, band of air, 20 volts, 20 volts, 20 volts. If fish stocks are to last, they must be conserved. Here at Lowestoft, scientists take samples from every catch to find the age and sex of the fish. Female, 45. Male, 41. 
Male. 40. Sex is determined by spotting the female ovaries in front of a light. Female. 42. And the age is determined by the length. Male. 41. Records kept by the scientists of the number of fish caught and their age and sex provide a guide and warning of the possible danger to future supplies. This is important. Today, Lowestoft thrives on the landing of flatfish, mainly place. But at one time, the entire port was given over to a single industry, the hunt for herring. And not only Lowestoft. For fishing communities stretching from the north of Scotland to East Anglia, the herring era was a golden age which made history. As we're following the shows of Heron, oh, it was a fine and a pleasant day. Out of Yarmouth Harbor I was faring as a cabin boy on a sailing lugger far to go and hunt the shoals of Heron. Oh, we left the home grounds in the month of June, and for canny shields we soon was barren, with a hundred crown of the silver darlings that we'd taken from the shoals of Heron. Each year, the fleet, with its workforce of gutters and curers, followed the shoals from Scotland down the east coast. Thousands of tons were pickled, much of it exported to Europe. This herring industry continued into the 60s, when new methods, used without thought for the future, wiped out the shoals of herring. The catches fell, and at Yarmouth and Lowestoft today, not a single herring is landed by the traditional methods. The deans, where the nets were hung out to dry, are now a relic of the past. But other fish are also in danger. Most species migrate along a closely defined route and gather in known areas according to the time of year. They're not scattered widely, but confined to that shallow part of the ocean around the coast known as the continental shelf, and this makes them easy for fishermen to track down. One way to conserve our stocks is to make better use of the fish we catch. Filleting, whether by hand or machine, produces a lot of waste. Cod fillets make up only 40% of the fish. The rest becomes fish meal or waste. Only a small saving here would mean a great deal of extra cod so the laboratory is testing a machine in which fish, including heads, can be rasped between a revolving grater and a rubber belt. The machine separates the flesh from the skin and bone so that nothing of the edible part is lost. At the moment, the only suitable product that can be made from the minced flesh is fish fingers. But cod is not the only fish in the sea. This is the monkfish. Its tail tastes like scampi. This is the catfish, the redfish, another very meaty, very tasty fish, and the gurnard but unfortunately, most people won't try something new. Coley fillet, for instance, on the left, is very like cod, except for the color. And as well as the fish that can be caught on the continental shelf, there are those in the deep oceans, where scientists have been trawling experimentally. One of the first jobs is to identify the species living in the deep oceans, some of which have rarely been seen before. This fish, with its hard, leathery skin, is a type of shark. It doesn't lay eggs, but gives birth to living young. This is the rhino chimera, 
the long snout is probably full of sensory glands for probing in the mud for its prey. And this is the rabbit fish. One day we may be eating fish like these. This is an oyster. 25 million eggs from the female will be fertilized by the sperm from the male and left to hatch. After hatching, the baby oysters, smaller than pinheads, are known as spat. The spat are carefully nurtured in the laboratory in special tanks until they have reached a size when they're too large to be eaten by starfish or crabs. They are then transferred to special sites on the seabed where they are left to grow. Twenty-one months after birth, the oysters are large enough to be harvested and sold. This idea of fish farming rather than hunting for fish is becoming more and more important. Here, in a laboratory in Conway in North Wales, scientists are experimenting with prawns. Every so often, the prawns are measured to check on the rate of growth. Although they're difficult to handle, in captivity they can be made to grow fast and reach edible size in four months as opposed to a year in the wild. These turbot are delicious fish. About a thousand tons are caught each year. But scientists here at the research laboratory in Lowestoft believe that by careful farming, the turbot catch could be doubled. The main problems for the scientists are in the early stages of life. When they hatch out, the turbot larvae are only six millimeters long and 98% of them die. Only 2% reach metamorphosis, the time when they change to the characteristic flat shape with both eyes on one side. This is 30 days old, and this 40, and this is 50, and from this stage the survival rate is much higher. The young turbot is very hardy and feeds and grows very rapidly. Because each mature female turbot produces over one million eggs, at the moment the scientists are working on ways to increase the survival rate after metamorphosis. After all, 2% of one million is a lot of turbot. Another farming possibility is the halibut. This is a juvenile. The adult grows to two to two and a half meters. At the moment, little is known of their breeding habits, and none has yet been bred in captivity. But with its rapid growth rate, the halibut would be a good fish to farm. Norway has about 250 salmon and salmon trout farms. Farm-bred fish are eaten before sexual maturity, because after that time, growth is much slower. The farms keep a stock of adult salmon from which the eggs are taken each autumn. The brood salmon are valuable, each worth about 70 pounds, but not many are needed, as one salmon can produce about 5,000 eggs. The fry, known as fingerlings, are kept in large circular tanks in which they can swim round without bruising themselves against any edges. Periodically, the small salmon are graded all those of the same size are kept together to avoid aggression and so that the end product is an average fish. When they would normally migrate, the salmon are moved to salt water in a blocked off fjord. There are 150,000 salmon here.
the salmon are fed on waste fish and the shells of shrimps. In the sea, salmon eat arctic krill, which makes their flesh pink. So captive salmon, denied krill, had turned their familiar colour by having shrimp shells as well as their normal diet. Fish farming will develop, but for a long time to come, our main source of fish will be the sea. Conservation now is important. Too much fishing today could mean no fish at all tomorrow. Come all you gallant fishermen that sail the stormy sea. The whole year round on the fishing grounds of the northern minch and the Norway geeks and the banks and knolls of the north.